I don't know, did you watch it? I did not see it, no. You did not watch it. I did not. See, I got a lot of stuff to do on a Halloween weekend. I got kids. I, I got a lot of stuff. Parties to do every day. Yeah, okay. So, um, I mean, it's a historic fight. The, um, you know, the uh, it, it was certainly not what everyone expected. Um, when it comes to, you know, obviously these MMA fighters going into boxing, they, other than Anderson Silva beating Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., um, which was a big upset, but, you know, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. was a no, con, you know, he wasn't ready to fight or anything like that. I mean, um, in this one, I think that um, Fury was not in his best shape. I think that was pretty clear. So nevertheless, um, Nagano did a, a great job considering how much of a skill disadvantage he had in the fight. Uh, he scored the knockdown. I mean, it was not, um, you know, he knocked him down in the third round, which was the key blow of the fight. And it was not a knockdown in the sense, I mean, it was a knockdown. It was a clean knockdown, but it was not like he knocked him out or like when Deontay Wilder nailed um, Fear. Fury in, I guess, his most famous knockdown, where, you know, it was impressive that he got up. In this one, you could tell he's going to get up, and he's going to continue to fight. And um, But still, you know, I mean, it was um, split decision. I had it uh, 95-94 for Fury, but there were close rounds. Um, I would have said that uh, I had um, uh, the... Uh, First round was for Fury. The second round for Fury. Third round, Nagano 10-8. Uh, four and five for Fury. Six for Nagano. Seven for Fury. Eight Nagano. Nine Fury and ten Nagano. So I mean, and and several of those rounds could have gone either way. So I mean, it was a fight that it was a very close fight. What I thought was really interesting was after round nine, and I had that. Um, you know, and and uh, two of the, you know one of the judges had the scores exactly the same as I did, and then uh, one of them had it the other way for uh, Naganu, and then one of them had Fury with a, a you know ninety six ninety three edge, and um, in that, but going into the tenth round, the Vegas odds had Naganu favored, even though I had him down by two points, um, so. A lot of the betters, I guess, thought because of the close round or maybe just because of the odds or whatever, although that point, it was just very interesting how that turned around. And I think maybe in a lot of ways, too, when people watched the fight, it was not a super exciting fight. And the rounds were all competitive for the most part. I don't think there was any really one-sided rounds. And the big blow was, like, if you're judging the fight as a whole, um, and you go, what was the strongest blow? I mean, Fury did land more punches. and um, But the strongest blow was Nagano's blow, obviously. And, um, you know, for a guy, I mean, it was, it was totally historic because, and they kept talking about that in, in the commentary. I mean, you're talking about like uh, an O and O fighter against an undefeated, you know, best heavyweight of this generation. I mean, it should have been a slaughter. As, as tough as Naganu is and as hard a puncher as he is, and they kept pushing the idea that he's on some system, whatever it is, that, that thing, that little punching thing that they got in the UFC gym, that um, nobody's ever hit it harder than Naganu. So there's like this punch stat thing, and he's, in theory, the hardest puncher in all of combat sports. And, and he may very well be. He's thrown some incredible punches. I mean, we've seen it in UFC, um, that when he hits you. Um, but that's also with smaller gloves. But, you know. Um, he, you know, he's probably going to do more boxing. Um, I know there's a lot of talk of, uh, Naganu against Deontay Wilder. I think there'll be a lot of interest in that one. Um, but, and they may do this one again. Um, and I don't think Fury took him seriously considering that seriously considering he booked another fight in December. Uh, whether he's going to do that fight now after this one, you know, who knows, you know, he went 10 rounds. Um, you know, you got, I, I, I didn't see this fight, Dave, but is this is this like, I mean, how many times does this have to repeat throughout history? Like, 
This has there's happened never been anything so like... many times. No, the guy that like, this oh, is, there's this, no this... chance this guy could possibly beat this guy, and then but there, but this, this you know, is the this guy is... goes in a little bit out of shape, and but this is actually completely unprecedented in the history of boxing. Well, I know there's... because it is, it is, it, it, yes. There's it, never, it, there's never been an Owen. There's never been an Owen boxer. But it's the same exact story of the guy. Well, it's who... the it's the it's, Ro- it's the Rocky one story. Sure, the... and it's happened in real life countless times. This person cannot be beaten. This person cannot be beaten. Well, there's no you watch such person the fight, and they're either beaten, or you know somebody comes very close, and you know you watch the fight, and you have the same thought: this guy didn't take this person seriously, and they agreed paid for it. Answers. Happens all the time. But it's never happened like this in heavyweight boxing history. Well, no, I mean Mike Tyson's fight, Mike, but this Mike happens Tyson, all the time. Mike Tyson and Buster Douglas would be the, the closest one, but Buster Douglas was at least, and as they pointed out, Buster Douglas was at least a real boxer. Um, although, and Mike Tyson was also in many ways an overrated boxer, but, um, you know, I mean, that was a bigger upset because at that point in time, nobody thought anyone could beat Mike Tyson and, you know, he got beat, um, in this one, I know. Yeah. I mean, look, if Nagano had landed one more punch at some point during the fight, he'd win the fight. You know, I mean, just one, you know, one more knockout and uh, that reverses it. If he had thrown a few more punches in one of many different rounds, he would have uh, one of the rounds would have flipped. There were rounds that could have flipped. Um, he could have won. And, and the thing is, it was then what happens because because this was a non-championship fight because of the fact that um, nobody's going to sanction this as a title fight when the guy's 0-0. So it would be something for an MMA fighter to beat. You know, in a, in a non-title fight, obviously you would probably wind up with a championship fight, and they, you know, if their round flipped, they they would have done they would have done a rematch, I guess, for the championship with a one and zero boxer, which still would have been unprecedented. And um, I think if Fury would take it seriously, um, or would have taken it more seriously, I'm not saying he didn't. He's he trained for twelve weeks for this. But, um, you know, I mean, he, he didn't look in his best shape or anything like that. Um, you know, in a rematch, I saw, the, the, the you know, the odds for a rematch, he's, he's, he would still be favored. He would probably take it more seriously. Um, but still, it was, um, you know, something, you know, an amazing, amazing performance by Naganu. He was the moral winner. Without a doubt, he was the moral winner. Had he... Even if he had lost by a wider margin and had not scored the knockdown, it's still a moral win. The fact that he fought a competitive fight, um, that he won, the fact he won even one round was a moral victory, in my mind, against with this kind of disparity of experience and skill. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, like when this fight happened, I wasn't taking it seriously, and most people weren't. You know, I know. A lot of boxing fans, and not not one of them bought the freaking pay per view after it was over. I, I asked a whole bunch of my friends, you know, who buy most of your big boxing matches, and I was like, nah, nah. And I would have been the same way, you know. I buy a lot of the big boxing matches. I had no interest in buying this one, partially because I'm tired of these what I would call you know the gimmick fights. I'm not interested in, you know, it's like at first when you do them, you know, it's the novelty and everything like this, but they've veered more and more towards this. And, you know, like the, you know, the biggest promoted fights are the Jake Paul and the Logan Paul and the ones that get the most attention because of, you know, social media and everything like that. And, um, and that's fine and good. You know, you're going to, you're going to do that. You're going to promote what you got. But to me, it was like, when you, um, you know, it, it, you can you only go you don't, can only go down that path, and everyone that has tried to go down that path, you have success at first because of celebrity fighting, and then after a while, it burns out because people have seen it, and I I don't know what um, the numbers are, and it doesn't matter because one of the things, you know, and and I mean it was funny because you know there were so many celebrities there you know from the mma world you know they brought in randy couture and chuck liddell and several others and um from the boxing world you know duran and you know uh, mike tyson of course and you know uh, Mar- you know barrera and morales and all these you know the, the whole thing and, and vince mcmahon and undertaker were brought in from from wrestling and it was did you see the vince mcmahon clip yes i did yeah pretty interesting yeah, he's uh, he's looking old. He's got a cane. 
But he's walking with a cane. Yeah. With a cane you know, he, had, back, he had major back, back surgery. surgery. Yeah. He had major back surgery. Well, I mean, the thing I thought was most interesting was he said, this is our home. He did that, say that Saudi Arabia was their home. That this is, is our, what he said. This is our home now. Saudi Arabia is our home. And he was out there going like all of the sports and entertainment are going to be, you know, the biggest events are going to be from here. And, um, you know, when he went, when they went and, and did the deal, and they weren't the first to do the deal, but they were one of the first. When they went to do the deal, you know, it was, you know, I mean, very heavily criticized. And at the end of the day, money talks, and now everybody's doing the deal, and everyone's going there, and UFC's even going there. And for, for, the, and for the kind of money they're offering, you know, in a free market business, you know, Saudi Arabia accomplished... Um, and is in, in you know they're accomplishing everything they set out to do with this goal, and the goal was to um, change the image of the country from the one with uh, you know the all of the human abuses and everything like that, and to instead make it the new Las Vegas, you know, with uh, you know all the big events and all the big things and this beautiful arena and this you know this is the home of WWE now, and uh, it's. You know, I mean, like when Vince said that, there was a part of me that was just like, oh, it's so it's kind of sad. And there was a part of me that said, you know what? I mean, you can't get mad at Vince when he's telling the truth. And, um, you know, I mean, he's probably not wrong on this one. And, you know, I thought it was interesting because you know, one of the reporters out there was uh, brought up the Dana stuff, you know, the Dana stuff with Vince. Because Dana White um, earlier in the week basically he did an interview where he was just like you know like vince is great with me now but my god i think it was uh, um i think it was wednesday night he just goes my god you know like you know he put me through so much and he was you know all the stuff you know you know and all the stuff when vince is competing with you that, that he puts you through and the mike goldberg thing the joe silva thing which people didn't really know um but the goldberg thing everybody knew you know you know trying to you know, that was de definitely one of the greatest attempted dirty tricks. And if someone wasn't as um, professional as Mike Goldberg, given the amount of money that that was offered, most people, you know, that you know would have taken the money, and UFC would have been out there. You know, this was this is years ago, um, but they would have been out there for a live show with no announcer, and then the guy who was supposed to announce their show would be showing up as the lead announcer on Raw. At the same time, I mean, it was it was actually one of, uh, you know, when it comes to Vince's tricks, it actually probably would have been the um, probably the best one ever, I would say. Um, I don't know. Is there anyone that where somebody showed up like that? I mean, like you could say, um, you know, when Hogan and Gene and Roddy, but Roddy Piper was not an unprofessional thing. Roddy Piper gave notice to Crockett, and and Crockett knew about Roddy Piper. Now, did Vern know about Hogan, Gene, and and Dave Schultz all showing up on Vince's show at the same time? No, he did not. So that was a that was a big one. But it wasn't. And 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 they, you know, Hogan did no show Vince's show, and then he did show up two days later. But this would have been, um, you know, like the last the last moment when you know, like. I mean, the, the idea was that Mike Goldberg would go to wherever, I forget the city that the UFC ran that night, but he would be there, he would be in the city, he'd be preparing for the show, and then, like, you know, whatever it is, two, three hours, kind of slip away, end up on Raw, you know, and as the new lead announcer on Raw. And, um, you know, um, they did that. Um, but it, I thought it was interesting because, you know, of course, now Vince and, and Dana are, are, you know, on the same team. And Vince was, um, you know, in, you know, one of the people who was working on the Saudi Arabia deal for UFC. And, um, you know, like basically that, you know, Dana's just praising Vince. And even when, when, when Vince was, you know, trying to bust Dana's balls or whatever it was, or what Dana thinks anyway, I mean, Dana never knocked. Dana would never knock Vince, you know, I mean, even even personally, you know, like even privately, I would say, you know, because um, I, I talked to Dana about Vince many times. And, and I think that there was there may have been like, a you know, a frustration here and there. I mean, but but as far as knocking him personally, he always praised him. He always talked about, you know, like, look, look, I mean, you know, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, I mean, Dana is the same type of cutthroat anyway, but it was like whatever. 
Vince, you would say, he always could look at his ratings because no matter what, one of the goals of UFC is ratings, and, and they never could do WWE ratings, ever. Yes, they could do better pay-per-views. Yes, they could do bigger live gates, but they could never do bigger ratings. And for whatever reason, and I think that, um, I think Vince, you know, and again, like he called Vince the Michael Jordan of business, which I think is a little bit of an exaggeration. I think the Michael Jordan of business would probably be like somebody like Warren Buffett or Bill Gates. I mean, but whatever. You know, they're on the same team now. But I thought that when uh, one of the reporters actually brought up the Dana stuff and, you know, I think Vince had no idea of those comments because, you know, he and and um, I don't think that he really rem seemed to remember anything because when they talked about Dana and then Undertaker kind of goes like, you're kind of the same. You're both alpha males. Maybe that's some of it because Undertaker probably knew a little bit about it. And then Vince gave this look and it was just like, I don't think he liked that Undertaker said that him and Dana were like the same for whatever reason. And Vince kind of made a comment, you know, about, well, if they're in my way and stuff. But it was very, um, you know, very interesting stuff, I suppose. You have Max Caster on Wednesday was giving MGF unwelcome physical groping. Daddy Ass has been calling himself Mr. Ass for decades now. And then you have the Iron Savages. All these men want to do, in their own words, is eat their opponent's asses. Yeah. Anthony Bones is the straightest guy in this match. Tony Storm also ate ass. What's going on here? Sky Blue has a very, um... Thick. Thank you. Uh, backside, of course, Tony's the same way. So they had to one-up that somehow. Kira Hogan, well, she fits the bill. Kira's running wild, and Tony cuts her off by eating her ass. This is the kinkiest wrestling show I've seen in a long, long time. Hey, guys, did you love this clip? If so, you should join our channel. Just hit the Join button, and you'll have full access to every single show that we do. Wrestling Observer Live, Wrestling Observer Radio, The Brian and Vinny Show. All of them in full HD, full length, plus archives of all of your favorite shows. Click Join today, and don't miss out.